All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to unit number four. This is our first lesson in unit four. A couple things I want to point out about unit four. Unit four is going to be the maritime empires. Now, in unit three, we looked at land empires. Now, we're actually going to send Columbus across the Atlantic Ocean, and the Europeans, mainly Europeans, are going to be setting up maritime empires. These maritime empires um, occur in a couple different ways. One, some are maritime empires that have a whole lot of land in them and re require colonization. And we'll see that when we look at England and France and Spain. Uh, but we'll also see something called a trading post empire in which not a lot of land is acquired, but the proper land is acquired. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like a little bit later. As I said, we call those trading post empires and our two big examples would be the Portuguese and the Dutch. Now, what I do want to point out is that we are still in unit four and our time period is 1450 to 1750. So this is the same time period as unit three. Let's go ahead and get started with our essential questions. Here are the essential questions for the unit. What are the various reasons Europeans established maritime empires in the Atlantic and Indian oceans? So we're looking at all of the different reasons. Maybe we're looking at motivations to do so. Um, it, such as, you know, what we're going to see is we're going to see that the Islamic empires that we saw in Unit 3, like the Ottoman Empire, are going to motivate Europeans to um, establish these maritime empires. But we also see that there's more practical reasons as well, such as obtaining wealth and spreading religion. Number two is what were the effects of these new interoceanic connections on both the old and new worlds? So when the old and new worlds finally come together through Columbus's voyage, we're going to see massive impacts on the old world, but obviously massive impacts on the new world as well. And in case you're unsure, when I say the old world, I'm referring to Afro-Eurasia, so Africa, Europe, and Asia. And when I say the new world, I'm including the Americas, which is North and South America. Now, what we're going to be doing in this lesson is we're going to look at the technology and the motivations behind all of this. So we're really beginning by looking at what's going on in Europe during this time period that would impel someone like Christopher Columbus or Hernan Cortes to finally sail across the Atlantic Ocean, or if you're the Portuguese, sail around the southern tip of Africa. Let's go ahead and move on to our um, first notes here. So the first thing that we need to be aware of, excuse me, is the technology. There's new technology that is now in place in Europe. And if we think back to unit two, we know that the reason that Europe has this technology is because of the trade route, specifically because of the Silk Road. So all of this knowledge is coming from India and China, going through the Silk Road to the Middle East and all the way to Europe. Now, the one I do want to point out is the Portuguese Caravel, which is right here. Now, this caravel was a small ship used by the Portuguese, but if you look at it, you'll see the way that the sails are aligned. These are Latin sails. They're at a uh, triangle instead of a instead of a square, which makes them more maneuverable. They're able to sail, um, not maybe not against the wind, but they don't necessarily need the wind directly behind them in order to sail. How did the Portuguese get this knowledge? Well, because the Portuguese are, as we're going to see in a second, going to engage in the Indian Ocean Exchange. The other uh, two ships are pretty big here. The Karak and the Flute are both used by Europeans in order to engage in travel. So the Flute is used here. It's a very large one. Um, and so that way you can carry more goods because trade is going to be a, a, an essential part of the connection between the old world and the new world. And the Flute, this is the Dutch sailing vessel, which is also very large here and not not able to be used for war. The reason this is so large is that the Dutch, as we're going to see, are going to take over the Spice Islands. And the larger ship they have, the more spices they can carry. The more spices they have, the more money they can make. We also see that there's other outside influences. So as I mentioned, the Latin sail is here. And for those of you who really like math, it's uh, right here as well. It shows you exactly how it works. But this Latin sail, for our purposes, we need to know that it was it came from Arab traders in the Indian Ocean Exchange that we went over in Unit 2. And the reason that the Portuguese are able to use the Latin sail in their caravel is because of their um, trade in the Indian Ocean Exchange. Other um, tech technology that's used is the compass and the astronomical charts. Both of those came from China and came to Europe because of the 
trade routes that we went over in unit two. So I know in unit two, I talked a whole lot about the trade routes. I know I talked a whole lot about who Europe is gaining all of the benefit, or at least most of the benefit from this trade. Now we're starting to see the effects of those benefits, of the fact that Europeans are the ones who benefited most from the Silk Road and those other big trade routes. Let's talk more about motivations here. So we know the technology, we know how they're able to do it, but we have to go over why. The first one is God. So there's three G's, which makes it easy to remember. The first one is God. Europeans, as we know, are very religious. Now, whether they are Catholic or whether they are Protestant doesn't necessarily matter for our discussion as of right now, because all of them are going to try to spread the Christian faith. Um, their idea is that if they can come to the new world, they can see the people who are there who haven't been influenced by any other religion so far, and they can convert them. And as we know, if more and more people are in your religion, then you have more and more power. For an example of this, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain, we saw they used divine right theory because everyone in Spain or almost everyone in Spain was Catholic. So we understand why religion is so important for the kings and queens of Europe. But in addition to this, and I didn't necessarily put this on here, we saw in Unit 3 the rising power of the Ottoman Empire and how the Ottoman Empire expanded to the West, taking the Balkans and going all the way to Hungary in the Battle of Mohac. What we need to realize is that Europeans are worried about their Muslim neighbors. They have been for a long time. Ever since we looked at the Crusades in Unit 1, we've been aware that the Europeans are almost fearful of this Muslim power in the East. And now that the Ottoman Empire is bigger and stronger than any other uh, Muslim power before, Europeans are getting more and more worried. There's actually an author I just I just read, and if you're interested, you can always ask me and I can um, at least link you to his book. Um, he put in there that the Islamic world is actually what motivated Europeans to go travel across the Atlantic Ocean to the West. Traditionally speaking, we say Columbus traveled to the West in order to get to the East. He wanted to reach China in order to gain trade. And part of that is true. We saw that the Ottomans took over Constantinople, renamed it Istanbul, and that cut off the trade routes for Europeans to the East. And so they wanted to sail West in order to get to the East and continue those trade routes. But this author goes beyond that. He says, in addition to that, Columbus had heard that people of the East, people in China, were very sympathetic to the Christian cause and also wanted to get rid of the Muslims. He was hoping to team up with them in order to take a European and Chinese force against the Ottoman Empire and the Muslim forces that were there. And that is, is partially part of it as well, is that many of these Europeans are worried about the Muslim forces and they want to find a way to stop them. One way in which they can stop them is hopefully linking up with the East and trying to uh, combine their forces in order to put down the Ottoman Empire. So there's a lot of reasons why, but all of those reasons are centered around spreading the word of God or spreading the Christian faith. The second one is glory. Well, why does anyone do anything? Well, because they want to be famous. They want people to give them attention. If you're a traveler like Columbus or Hernan Cortez, you can gain a lot of glory. And whenever you have glory, as we know, if you're famous, you also have a lot of wealth. There's been tales that there's a lot of gold in the new world and that if you go to the new world, you can pick up gold off the ground. In fact, one of the big stories is the story of El Dorado. This story about how this entire city is made of gold, how the roads are paved with gold. And any European can go there and just pick up the gold off the ground. We see that that's really not, not true. And most travelers who come to the New World don't get rich very quickly. Um, but there is still a motivation, this uh, desire for wealth. Um, and glory are big motivating factors for some of these uh, travelers that will be going uh, over in this unit. Now, our first explorers, our you know, first explorers from Europe, are the Portuguese. Now, they are centered around Prince Henry the Navigator, who navigated a little bit. But what he's mainly known for is creating a school and, because he has a whole lot of money, financing the expedition. So without Prince Henry the Navigator, Bartolomeo Diaz and Vasco de Cama are absolutely nothing because they don't have money. But because Henry the Navigator can finance them and, um, pay, uh, you know, and teach them uh, the ways of sailing, um, now Bartolomeo Diaz and Vasco de Gama become 
actual people we need to study. So who are they? Bartolomeo Diaz sails down the western coast of Africa to the Cape of Good Hope. That's at the very southern part of Africa, South Africa. He does that in 1488. But he doesn't go any further because he doesn't have the proper supplies and because it's a pretty dangerous journey. But what it does prove is that he, the Portuguese are capable of finding a sea route all the way to the Indian Ocean Exchange. It's about 10 years later that Vasco da Gama finally does that. So no longer do the Portuguese need to go by land. Now they can go by sea. This is huge for the Portuguese because now they can get there much more quickly. And it's horrible for the Italians. The Italians were the ones who had connections to the East. They had connections to the Ottoman Empire via the Mediterranean Sea. And that was their big advantage. That's why the Renaissance happened in Italy is because they had all the trade and they had all the wealth because of their geographic location. But now that geographic location does not give them any advantage because the Portuguese have found a way around Africa. Now, they establish a trading post empire, and we'll see how this is different than the other types of empires that the Spanish and the English and the French um, and, uh, established in the New World. But in order to show you this, it's just best to show you this map right here. So what we see is everything in green belongs to the Portuguese. Now, when we look at a map of the English colonies, we'll see a lot of English colonies right here. When we look at French colonies, we'll see colonies in Haiti. We'll see colonies in Canada. When we look at uh, the Spanish, we'll see all of this will be the color for the Spanish. But we see there's not actually that much land other than like Brazil that belongs to the Portuguese. So why is this a trading post empire and why is this so important? Well, this trading post empire is just that. It's just that the fact that they have control of these cities. And when I say they have control, they're usually ruling through intermediaries. So, for example, the leaders of these cities still get to be leaders. They just have to pay tax to the Portuguese. So one big continuity here is that in the Indian Ocean Exchange, there's still a lot of trade between India, the Swahili coast of Africa, China, and these Muslim merchants. The big change is that the Portuguese now control this. Instead of being a free market, the Portuguese have these choke points in which you need to pay a tax in order to go through and trade. This is very similar um, to what was going on in the Strait of Malacca, if you think all the way back to Unit 1 with the Srivijaya and the Majapahit. The reason they became so rich is they own the, the trading routes and, be, and they could charge taxes to anyone who wanted to use them. So for example, what will happen is that the Portuguese will have these two areas right here, or Muz and Musket. If you're a Muslim trader and you want to get out to the Indian Ocean Exchange over here and start trading, well, you have to pay a tax in order to get through this part right here. This is what Alfonso de Albuquerque, he's a Portuguese captain. This is what he does. This is his brilliant idea to own all of these trading cities to let the leaders continue to have their share and just pay tribute and taxes to the Portuguese. This is how the Portuguese gain a whole lot of wealth. The last thing I want to talk about are the African kingdoms. I'll mention them now. And then obviously, when we talk about the slave trade, we'll be bringing up these again. So one big continuity is that this part of West Africa is a source of wealth. As we looked at when we looked at the Mali Empire and the Songhai Empire, we saw that they gained their wealth via trade, mainly through gold, ivory, slaves, and salt. Now, the big change is that the Mali Empire is gone. The Songhai Empire is gone. Two major kingdoms on the west coast of Africa take over. The first one is the Asante Kingdom. And this will not be the last time we hear about the Asante Kingdom because we're going to talk about them more in Unit 6. They will continue trading gold, ivory, and slaves with the Portuguese. And as you can see right here, the Portuguese are working with the people of the Asante Empire in West Africa in order to uh, obtain slaves that they're going to trade. We will go into more detail on the slave trade a little bit later in this unit. The other big one is the Kingdom of the Congo, which is right down here. And as you can see, this is in modern day Angola. Now we'll be talking about this particular area a little bit more, especially with Anna Nzinga, and we'll see some of the revolts by uh, the people of this particular area of what we now know as Angola. But once again, that will be in a different unit. We'll see that the Kingdom of the Congo actually converts to Christianity because of the Portuguese, partially because the Portuguese forced them to, 
partially because it allows for more trade to occur if you all believe in the same guy. But we're going to see that the kingdom of the Congo will also become a major source of slaves. So we're going to see a lot more trading in this particular part of Africa, in Western Africa. But we're also going to see that this is an unfair trade. The trade that we talked about in Unit 2 was very much free trade. Um, at least to a certain extent. Obviously, there were some taxes and whatnot. But in this type of trade, we're going to see that there's one society that benefits greatly, and that's mainly the Europeans, and one side that does not benefit at all. In fact, it's very devastating for them, and that will be the people of West Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, that will go ahead and finish up my lecture on this particular um, section right here. So please make sure you have your notes and you bring your notes to class so that way you're ready to go and finish the assignment that I give you in our synchronous learning session.